I'm Paul Goddard, clinical hypnotherapist and master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming. This is the first of a series of interviews I will be making with motivated and successful people. This first interview is with Jamie McDonald, who hit the news in 2012 with his challenging feats of firstly cycling from Bangkok to Gloucester then breaking the record for distance cycling on a static bike and most famously running across Canada in 2013-2014 dressed as a superhero. Jamie is very humble and his humour aided his success through some of the most challenging times of his adventures. After the interview I will address the key points of what I have learnt from interviewing this avid adventurer. So listen Take note, enjoy, and be inspired by this incredible man. Okay, Jamie, so if you can start off by saying about your early days from being in hospital, when the first see the idea that you're going to do something amazing with your life. <laughs> well, I had no idea that I was going to end up, you know, why they say I'm an adventurer, which is just nuts, really. I didn't even know that existed. Uh, but I guess... Uh, the first kind of nine years of my life, um, I spent most of the time in hospital. So I've got a very rare condition called Schwingermyelia. And so symptoms as a kid, uh, sometimes I couldn't move my legs, um, had epilepsy, and, and I was just really, really sick. But at nine years old, my mum, she was like, should we go and play tennis, Jamie? And she put this piece of string on the back garden. And she was like, come on, let's play. Uh, and I remember thinking that I didn't really feel like playing, but I was like, bugger it, I'm going to get out there and I'll, I'll crack the ball. And that was almost like the first time that I got my real love for movement. And in that year, the symptoms gradually disappeared. And I'm really, really lucky because, you know, I, I could have lost my mobility all my life. And so, yeah, when I when I turned kind of 16, I had this massive vision to be like Tim Henman or Roger Federer and... Uh, but and, uh, yeah, I kind of discovered beer and girls and it kind of took a different direction then. Uh, I guess that's the kind of early years. Correct me if I'm wrong, your first challenge was the Bangkok cycling, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the first idea when you thought, I'm going to do this, because I know so many people think, I'm going to do something amazing, I'm going to do this uh, fundraising for charity, and they talk about their mates, and that's as far as it actually goes. What was it that really pushed you to go ahead and actually go, you know what, I'm actually going to book the, the, the tickets to go on this flight to actually do this? Well, at the time, I was I was kind of living with my mum and dad, and, and I've got to tell you about my mum and dad, because it is linked in to, I guess, the reason why I went to Bangkok to Gloucester on a bike. But while I lived there, my, my dad, he'd been a bricklayer all his life, and he literally comes through the door and he just said to me and my mum, do you know what, like, I hate what I do. And me and my mum were like, well, don't do it. You know, you don't need to do it anymore. anymore. And I think he just felt the, the need to provide. Um, and so he quit his job and then he started working with people with mental health and learning difficulties. You know, like the real kind of mental health, the ones that attack you. Um, and he got hit in his face on the, on the very first day and he literally came through the door. And he's just, I've just had the best day of my life. Um, and he's been doing that now for five years and he's on minimum wage and he just absolutely loves what he does. He's, he's found his passion. And at the same time, my mum, she's always spoke about fostering like all our lives, but she never really followed through with it. You know, she was one of oh, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. In the end, she was like, come on, let's do it together. So we had our first girl, Bella, who was like 15 years old. And she visited about 25 care homes in the space of you know eight months. So we knew it was going to be really difficult. And, and literally, she came to the door. She was like swearing at us nonstop. But as a family, we kind of just kept getting together going, do you know what? I think it's just a sign of affection. And we actually kept Bella uh, for you know an entire year. And she went back with her mum and dad. And I just suddenly realized that my mum and dad, they fell into their passion of helping people. And at that time, I was saving up to put a deposit on a house. I was like working my absolute socks off. And I went to go and sign the papers to buy this house. And then I had that gut feeling in the stomach. 
And I just thought, something's not right. I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. And then I suddenly realised that the only reason why I was buying the house is because everyone else around me was buying one. So I thought about my mum and dad and actually what is it that I want out of life. So I then got in touch with the children's hospital and I just said, look, I feel like maybe I'm in a time in my life where I can give back to you. And I, I feel like I'm going to do something bonkers. And then a couple of weeks later, I bought a second-hand bicycle for 50 quid out of the newspaper. And then I flew. I never really cycled before, and off I went to Bangkok. Was there any real planning with this, or was it just, I'm going to do it, and then just you just did it? Absolutely winging it. Uh, start to finish. Yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. Just fly, flew out, and, and I just kind of hoped for the best. How inspirational were your parents in getting you to do what you done with your, your ventures? Was it something that you think you would have done if it wasn't for their influence? Well, my mum absolutely hated the idea of cycling from Bangkok to Gloucester, but she's just a mum, really. That's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to worry. Um, my dad, on the other hand, he's just he's like, yep, yeah, go for it, son. But I, I, I guess I didn't realise that my mum and dad kind of inspired me at that time. Uh, and it was your mum and dad, you know, he's like, do they really inspire you? You know, you don't really want to admit it. But actually, years on, I kind of realise now and I look back and, and yeah, they did. Obviously, when you were doing your Bangkok cycling, there's the story you don't mind sharing with people that you got incredibly saddle sore and actually got infected. It sounds like it was incredibly painful at times. What was going through your mind to motivate yourself, to keep yourself going when, you know, your body's probably screaming out to go, stop this, have a rest? Uh, well, at the beginning, it was all so new that uh, a lot of it was adventure. You know, every single day I woke up, I didn't plan a single day. I never knew what was round the corner or round at the end of the road. So seeking kind of every day something new um, was, was a way of kind of, you know, keeping your mind stimulated and, and excited. But you're right, you know, as time went on, I, I, I quickly tired. And, and you know, it, it, it wasn't easy to, you know, go through places like China where they don't speak a word of English and you get lonely. And then I had to withdraw upon actually something else that I didn't really know existed. And uh, I think kind of just fighting your inner demons and, and, and battle to, to keep going. Uh, but I, I realized it was something a little bit more than that. I, I started to share the journey and with YouTube videos. And then the messages that were coming back from that was like, you know, I'm, I'm loving your videos. I'm now going to cycle around the world. Um, and then I got messages coming in saying, you know, keep going, Jamie, from the children's hospital that I was raising money for. And I could see the figures going up. And so that became a huge drive to me was to fundraise for the hospital, but also to kind of reach out to people. Was there a moment that you can talk about when you suddenly realized that you had something within that you might have not realized that you had with inside you before? Maybe, you know, when I was caught on a war zone on, in, on the border of Afghanistan, I woke up one morning and there was just fireworks everywhere and and literally I, I genuinely thought it was fireworks but then I, I kind of dawned on me that it was actual gunshots and explosions and I quickly grabbed the camera because I was filming everything and as I was filming uh, you know I had lights on my camera and it was still dark so I was literally waving like this massive light in the middle of a war zone and I was shot at and I was trapped with uh, 18 other tourists and luckily I wasn't hit but after those 30 hours a guy turned up and said look there's a there's a ceasefire for two hours you must get out of here you know and, and it's going to get a lot worse and everyone everyone we all left but everyone wanted to go home after that and, and I did as well you know I wanted to go home but I just thought you know what it will be just a story to tell um, and if I can get through this and you know I, I could get through anything. After you've done that with, obviously, the terrifying times with, with being shot at, you decided to then do the second adventure by going across Canada. And I know you were greatly inspired by Terry Fox. How did you first get to hear about his story? So when I, when I got back after the Bangkok to Gloucester, I ended up kind of jumping on the static bike and managed to break the world record for 12 days. And, and I guess, again, I ended up achieving something that I never thought I could. And, you know, after that, I kind of had a visa for Canada and I was literally going to go there on holiday and be a backpacker. But everyone around me in Gloucester was like, Jamie, you know, what What are you doing next? What are you doing? And in my mind, I'm thinking, 
I've done enough already. Well, what do you mean, what am I doing next? But it kind of felt right. Um, and at this point, it raised £20,000 for the children's hospital, which was a new school playroom. I thought, do you know what? I've still got money left over from my deposit on the house that I didn't buy. Let's keep going. So I'm sat on the toilet at my mum and dad's house. And I'm like, all right, well, I could never really cycle before. Maybe I could have a go at running. So I, I ran out and I just went, Mum, Dad, I'm going to run across Canada. And like my mum was like, oh, no, Jamie, not again. And my dad, he was just like, you know, his veins started pulsating on the side of his head. And he was like, yes, son, that's it, yes. Um, and so from that moment, I was like, right, let's stick this into Google. Literally a minute later, and that's when Terry Fox came out. Um, all over the screen and it was it was a guy that actually ran across Canada in the 1980s um, with cancer in one leg and I watched a YouTube video of him and I never felt so inspired it like brought me to tears and suddenly I thought you know what if if he can do something like this in his circumstances in the 1980s which is unheard of to do a challenge like that then maybe I could have a go too you know maybe I could achieve it did you do exactly the same route that uh, Terry took? I think so, pretty much, yeah. I mean, that you know, it was 5,000 miles to go across Canada, so I'm like, right, I need to pick the best route, the shortest route, and that was normally the highway, uh, which I think pretty much what Terry Fox done. I know that Terry Fox didn't make it to Vancouver. When you got to Vancouver, were any thoughts running through your mind um, about, you know, I've now gone further, and any thoughts to Terry at that particular stage? I think that the time I really thought about Terry Fox was halfway where he actually died um, and, and there was a monument there that they've put in place and as I came up to Thunder Bay which is where the monument is there were people literally turning up on the side of the road and crying like like crying to me and just saying you know thank you for doing this and it just suddenly realized that they weren't crying at uh, what I was doing but I think I brought back memories for them for when Terry Fox you know attempted to do it and didn't make it um, and so when I got to the monument there was literally hundreds of people there to support me and kids dressed up as superheroes and so I uh, you know that was the moment for me that I kind of thought about Terry Fox and how sad it was that, that, that he didn't get the chance to finish off the run I remember you were talking about when I've seen you on the television, you're, you're very humbled how people treated you, invited yourself into their homes, and some people were giving you food from small things to bananas to a complete hot meal. Anything that really sort of stood out your mind that's really kind of made you feel quite humble at that moment? Uh, do you know, there was a, a Facebook group that, that got set up, and, and they called themselves Stalking Mama Bears. And literally, I was probably about 120 marathons in, and... I was in a complete whiteout storm running at 8 o'clock at night and as I'm running through this fire engine turned up and, and they were like, hey, are you Jamie McDonald? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And I was literally, I could hardly see a single thing and they're like, we're here to take you in. And so they drove alongside me as I ran into this little village and then all these people come running out and they were kind of clapping me in as I came running in. And, and that was down to the stalking mama bears, you know, calling up ahead, you know, just because they were genuinely worried about my safety and worried about me. But, you know, they would call ahead and it would net their great networkers. Um, and so that really stood out to me. But they, they actually took it one step further. So there was one mama bear, she called up and she was like, James, like, have you been on a date since you've been in Canada? I was like, well, no, you know, I haven't, you know, I've been in the woods. And uh, anyway, a week later, I forgot about the conversation. This car pulled up and she said, hey, she said, I'm one of the stalking mowers. We spoke the other day. And then she handed me a bouquet of flowers. And I was like, thanks. I was like, what do you want me to do with these? And she was like, well, she's like, about a kilometre down the road, there's a camper van and there's a candlelit dinner and a hot Canadian girl waiting for you. So I literally ran my socks off for a whole kilometre. And, and that's the end of my story. Oh, there's a very, it was shown a lot on the Sky News and BBC News of a moment of when you actually went in the wrong direction, you actually saw the same sign that you saw before. How do you actually pull yourself up back from that? Because I guess a lot of people would have been completely crushed by that moment. What, what did you do? What was going on inside your, your mind at that time? <laughs> so I woke up in the morning and, and I did, like, both sides of the road looked identical. 
And so when I got out, I, you know, out of the tent, I got on the road and then I got running. And in my mind, there was five miles and I knew I was about to hit a restaurant and I hadn't seen anything for days. So I was really looking forward to this restaurant. I was thinking, you know, I'll have a lovely breakfast. Anyway, and I carry on running and I do the five miles and I look at my Google phone, like on the map, and I'm like, hang on a minute, I'm even further away from the restaurant. How can that be? I'm like, the phone must be broke. So I just put it away and I carry on running. And then, bam, I saw a sign that I saw the day before. And I just realized I woke up and actually just went running completely in the wrong direction. So I, I, I cracked. I mean, I, it was it was like faulty towers. Basil just completely going off my yeah, rocker. But, you, you know, it's, like, it's like almost like a slingshot, isn't it? It's like you go backwards... And when you go backwards, you get pulled backwards, but then it's just motivation, then you fly forwards. Very good. Is anybody that's actually wishing to do something similar and actually thinking, I'm going to, to do this, what, what advice could you give them? Uh, okay, so I've got a bit of a story, if this, if this helps at all. I'm not sure if it does, but well, I'll go for it. So when I'm halfway across Canada, this man gave me a massage and he said, Jamie, I, I think I know why you can take on these big adventures. And I said, well, tell me, I, I don't really know why. Or, you know, and he said, well, there are two different types of people in this world. You've got the planner and you've got the naive. The planner, when they do their supermarket shopping, they write a list before they go. And then they make sure they take all the right roads with Google Maps. And then they go in, they go down all the right aisles because they know where everything is. And it's very, very stress-free. And he said, you've got the naive. And they don't write a list before they go. They get lost along the way. They go in, they come back out. And like, I forgot this, this, this. I need to go back in. Eventually, they get the job done, but it's quite stressful. Now, the difference between the two is that the planner can plan stage one, two, three, four, five. But when you get to stage 20, suddenly part of your journey, it's it, you just can't plan beyond that. And it's all a bit murky. So the tendency for the planner... Sometimes they don't start the journey in the first place because of this. But the naive, he said, he said the naive, he said they don't think about stage one, two, three, four, let alone stage 20. So they just plod on through. And then I realized that actually it doesn't matter which one you are. Because I thought about the planner. And if, you, if you're a planner, it's about taking a pinch of naivety and just going with the flow of it. And if you're naive, then I just really, really suggest on planning. I know that you also said that you visualized many times putting your hands in the Pacific Ocean. How much visualization did you do? Because being an NLP master practitioner, we're very much into visualizing the future. How much visualizing were you doing with that through your journeys? Well, while I was on my own, you know, you, you the, the best times, the best times would be running a marathon and you'd get to the end of the marathon and you'd be like, what? What just happened? Like, have I, have I just finished? Is it over? And I'm like, wow. And so it's almost like a subconscious that you go into where you, you do. You start imagining, uh, you know, the finish and your family, your friends, everything that's very nurturing. And, and But I guess that was it really, is that I didn't realize that I'd go off into this kind of, you know, imagination at the time. It just kind of, you know, when you... I guess the example I can use is sometimes when you're driving down on the motorway and as you're driving, suddenly you're like, you kind of wake up and it's like 30 minutes later and you think, have I just have I just done all these miles? Where did it go? What happened? What did I think? And they were kind of normally the best days that, and, and the most easiest to get through. Also, not just big things. Sometimes people do very small steps and it ends up being... A great big huge step for them even though we might not think so from outside the foot servers and you're talking about a friend of yours that now doing amazing things if you can tell that story that you told downstairs about him dancing actually but getting a nerve to go up and dance to begin with yeah so I, i've kind of met another big adventurer and he does crazy challenges he ended up cycling around the world a couple of times over the space of four years and i, I kind of remember reading something about him where uh, he said he was like 10 years old and he had this fear to go up into his like this this disco to dance in front of people, and everyone was telling him to like come on, come on, dance, dance, and he really, really didn't want to. And then he's like, 
fuck it, go on then. I, let's just let's just do it. What am I what, what am I so scared of? And he got up and he danced. And he used that as an example of that was just one small fear that he broke, that he that he surpassed. And then later on now in his adult his adulthood life, he's now, you know, cycling around the world. So you're right, I think it's about, you know, down to the individual, but breaking those small bits of fear, things that you don't really want to do because you're scared, and then conquering them. And then that leads on to other things in life that you have that are just unimaginable. If you can talk a little bit about the Superhero Foundation and how people can get to sponsor people or if they even want to get involved, what, what can be done? Uh, so the Superhero Foundation was set up with me and Kev, which is my cousin. He's also paddled the Mississippi. So we like the adventure world, but we, when we set it up, we didn't really know which direction it was going. And then, you know, a family got in touch and just said, look, I've heard you're now a registered charity. Can you help? And we're like, we're not really sure. And we just turned up the next day at their house, knocked on the door, and this guy answered James. And he's like, hi, lads, do you want a beer or do you want a coffee? And we're like, well, we'll take a coffee for now, James. And then we met the family and we learned about them, that they'd raised £30,000 in the last year and they worked their socks off to get it. And they needed another twenty for this operation in America for their daughter, Charlotte, who was three years old. And she's got cerebral palsy. And they said, this operation has got the chance to enable her to walk. Um, but we feel like we've used our family and friends for fundraising. And we just, we want to branch out. We don't know if we can raise this extra 20. Can you help? Like, well, maybe. And we're like, well, who wants to be a superhero to the mum and the dad? And they both kind of pointed at each other, you know. And then we're like, right, well, who wants a challenge? And that's when James, the dad, I was like, do you know what? I fancied a challenge all my life. I was like, good. And I worked out the day before that if he went up and down Robinswood Hill in Gloucester 75 times, that would be the equivalent of reaching Mount Everest. When I told him this, his face was absolutely mortified. Uh, but, you know, after five minutes, he was like, all right, I'll do it. And the next day, he then goes and does 25 summits. And bear in mind, this man has done no fitness training in years. And then he calls me up and he's like, Jamie's like, my knee is absolutely buggered. And I felt like screaming at him and saying, of course it's buggered. You know, you haven't done anything all these years. In the end, I just turned around and said, do you know what, James? Don't worry about it. It's happening in a month's time. Just don't aggravate it now. Turn up. And it's going to be your mind that will get you through this, not not your physicality. And so anyway, he turns up at the, the, the hill. He does 20 hours nonstop. And then after 20 hours, he literally comes out and starts crying his eyes out. And he's like crying and crying. I'm like, oh, I didn't really expect this at this time because in my head I knew there was another 40 more hours to go. And so I told him a story about Terry Fox. And, and I said about, you know what, there's a guy that went across Canada with cancer and one leg. And he just looked up at me at the end of this story and he was like, what, with a stump? And I was like, yeah, with a stump. And he was like all the way across Canada. I was like, all the way across. And I thought I'd just leave the part out, which, which that Terry Fox actually died halfway. And so, yeah, he ends up getting up and he just like, hum, like stumbled on. Um, and then I thought we'd read out some Facebook messages out to him, you know, as motivation. So we start, you know, the first one's like, come on, James, you're giving your daughter a real life future. And, and I'm looking at him, and I'm kind of looking at him in such a state, and the messages that were coming in, I was kind of getting quite choked up. And then BBC Radio Gloucestershire were there. They put the mic to his mouth, and he starts pouring his heart down the mic, saying, I've just got to do this for my family. And because it was 7 o'clock on a Monday morning, it just went off. Like, everyone was driving to work, and it went viral. It went national. Um, and all, hundreds of people just started turning up to the hill, just donating fivers, tenors, saying, I've just heard him on the radio. And then, you know, he just starts going up, and then we're like, we still don't know if he's going to make it. So then my cousin Kev, he was like, right, we put up posters at the bottom of the marquee, 10, 9, 8, 7, to visually, he would go down, rip it down, and he'd be another summit closer. And we thought it was a great idea. He gets to number four after doing this. There's hundreds of people at the bottom of the hill. And he looks at everyone. And, and James is this really quiet and humble guy. And he's like, come on. It was like Andy Murray on the Wimbledon final. He goes over to number four. He rips it down. He eats it. We're like, where's James gone? Like, where's he actually gone? And he starts legging it for the last few summits. Like, no one could keep up with him. And so we literally were right. 
Let's go up on that final summit with joints. So hundreds of us, we all go up. We give him and his wife a bit of time on their own to have a bit of smooch on the summit because they've had a difficult year. And then we joined them and I just said, James, just so you know, you have now conquered Mount Everest. And he had no idea with the fundraising target. And we said, just so you know, you've smashed over £20,000. You've got all the treatment for your daughter. Um, and we sprayed him full of champagne. And you kind of want to bottle that moment up when you've achieved something that you never thought you could. So I just looked at him and I said, James, just overlook Gloucester now for 20 minutes. We're all going to go down the Botman Hill. We'll see you when you get there. And just really enjoy this and digest what you've achieved. And he's looking at me. He's like, okay, okay. He's just not even there. You know, and then we all go down at the bottom. 20 minutes later, he joins us. And, and Charlotte was there in her wheelchair holding the number one sign came down, took the number one time, gave her a big massive hug and then we set off fireworks and that was the start of Superhero Foundation. So we inspire and empower kind of like, you know, real life uh, people to, to achieve their fundraising dream. And I think it's, it, it's, it, it, it's beautiful because I think my motivation towards it wasn't necessarily Charlotte, you know, that was James, but the fact that James got to give a speech by the end of it and he just said you know what like I'm just a guy off the street I'm a normal bloke and he's like anything is possible and now we have lots of other families kind of um, popping up that we're helping that are doing extraordinary challenges too. Some people often say that you know I'd love to do something like that but I'm too busy or I'm too old and sometimes it can be people's mental blocks in the way rather than actually really what they they can or can't do what would you say to those people to actually think it is possible it's never too old to do something amazing yeah it's absolutely right no, I, I immediately think of Ranulph Fiennes you know I think he's I think did he nearly hit 80 years old and he just done like you know like five marathons through the Sahara Desert so you've only got to hear about people's stories and and then once you hear those stories I think then it's time to question yourself a little bit and think you know what if they can do it you know can you do it and and often you know what it doesn't have to be something monumental as long as you're pushing a little bit of your comfort zone and just pushing that you know you a, a, a bit of fear and breaking it you never know what path will lead on from that and you also are known for doing motivational speaking now if you can say a little bit about that and how you got involved yeah, so when I got back from Canada, lots of schools and, and were asking me to do talks. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I carried on with the fundraising and that kind of built up to the quarter million uh, pounds for the hospitals. But then I ran out of money. And when I ran out of money, I went straight up to my dad. And I was like, dad, so do I need to go back tennis teaching? And I was like, I've, I, there's a school that's asking me to go and I, I don't even have any fare to get there. And he was like, do you know what, son? He's like, it looks to me like you found what you love. Just keep doing it and it will all work out. And he said it was so much passion and so it was so motivational. And I was like, yes, all right. And I, and I walked off and I was like, thanks, Dad, thanks. And then like a few minutes later, I was like, you know, I still got the same problem here. I still got no money. Um, and then it just so happened, literally a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from Nigel Pervo, which is a guy that's quite high up in Capita. Um, as a director and he said Jamie I've heard you've been doing lots of talks in the Gloucestershire area how would you feel about doing talks in the offices and I was like yeah okay and he was like and we'd like to pay you and I was thinking oh, no you like you don't you don't need to pay no you know um, and then I thought you know what maybe this is my time like maybe maybe this is this is what's going to happen so I said yes and the moment I said yes I started to absolutely melt down because then I realized that what I'm saying kind of almost proves value and I was thinking I don't know nothing about the business world I was like what shall I wear shall I wear a suit shall I wear a tie and I spent all week I, I, I was just I, I couldn't think straight and then literally the day that I was going in to give the talk I was like suit or do I just wear my normal clothes suit or do I just wear my normal clothes and in the end I just turned up in a pair of shorts and flip-flops and I just said to everyone there I said listen I don't know your world I don't get it I said, I'm just going to share my story and just feel free to take whatever you want from it. Um, and then it kind of spiraled. So then Nigel kind of sent me to Ireland and Scotland and around all the offices. And now it's my living uh, motivational speaker, which I, I just, again, didn't know existed, but absolutely love to share my passion. How did you find from doing the adventures to actually standing up? I mean, were you at all nervous when it was your, your first time having to stand up in front of people? And did you pull on anything you learned over your adventures and your travels to help you on stage? It's a really good question. I think 
I, I read a book quite recently and it said, because uh, I'm now learning how to kind of try and reach out and, and, and have an impact while you speak, because it's quite an art, you know, and it's something that I'm still quite, still learning quite quite on a steep learning curve. You know, I've only been doing it just over a year. And one of the one of the main points that said you cannot be a speaker, a professional speaker, um, unless it's your passion. You know, I'm not up there because it makes me money. I'm up there because I'm telling stories about my life, and I want to inspire people. Like that's that is that's my sole motivation, and I th I'd like to think that 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 comes across. Uh, so I feel quite lucky that I get to just talk about everything I love. Uh, so hopefully it comes across like that, and it's and it makes my life a little bit easier to talk about what I love. Fantastic. Do you want to give out your web details, and if anybody wants to get in contact with you at all, uh, that would be amazing. So yeah, you can you can follow me on Twitter at Mr Jamie McDonald, um, or you can go to the website www.jamiemcdonald.org um, and just shoot a message through there. That'd be awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to add that I haven't asked you? I don't think so. I think we've I think we've smashed it. Thank you very much, Paul. I thought it was great. Yeah, you were awesome. Jamie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I was struck with his determination to help others achieve their fundraising dreams. I found that Jamie's slingshot metaphor to push yourself forward after a setback incredibly useful, and I have now used this in my own life too. I like the way he reframed the dramatic events of being shot at. What do I mean by reframing? In NLP, reframing is a term used to switch a negative perspective to a more positive one, to change the angle of your thinking and to see things in a different light. The negative situation can help you look at things in a way that you would have not thought of. It is important to plan any adventure, he said. You need planning with a touch of naivety. The planner will overplan and never actually get started. And if you are naive, you will find yourself getting into trouble without pre-planning. I particularly like the story of his friend who pushed his comfort zone by dancing when he felt too shy. This seemingly small act which was huge for him gave him confidence to embark on many adventures the main point here is to push yourself no matter how small to do something that you would normally avoid and the fear will lose its hold on you again for more information about jamie mcdonald see jamiemcdonald.org and to discover more about myself NLP and how hypnosis can help you make a positive change in your life, please see paulgoddardnlp.co.uk. That's paulgoddardnlp.co.uk. You can also like me on Facebook, Paul Goddard NLP and Hypnotherapy. Until the next time, thank you.